um, uh, webinar. Can yeah. you guys see that all right? Yep. yep. Yes. Cool. And uh, pick up the spelling errors now if you want. That's if there are any. Cool. So we've got a couple of people in already. Fiona and Nick, welcome. Just waiting for a few more people to join us. I'm just wondering, Paul, why the person on the motorbike hasn't got a helmet on. Hopefully <laughs> they don't work for New South Wales government. No, no. Well, this is actually one of those slides where you use in the work health and safety presentation, Paul, to <laughs> get people to identify some of the issues. <laughs> and uh, and that's one of them as well. And I, I don't think there's uh, the, the person with the calculator there there's no safety strap on that either might just fall to the ground and break <laughs> so yeah mm -hmm. give a, a couple more minutes here for the people finishing up watching the the abc news or credlin or whatever they might be watching Welcome, Susan. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, that's all right. We're just uh, marking time a little bit here for a few more latecomers. We'll give a couple more minutes. I suspect uh, quite a few people rely on the recordings for these later. So that's not too much of a problem. So anyone who comes along gets priority in their questions. That's a good thing. And Susan, where are you based? Uh, we're at Anger Farm. Oh, OK. Uh, not too far up the road then? No. That's good. And uh, how's your season looking these days? Um, oh, well, we've had better and we've had worse. Um, mm. It'll all go poof if we get a bit of hot weather and don't get any rain, but it's sort of looking like it might rain tomorrow. Uh, sorry, on Friday. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's not brilliant, but we're getting there. Yeah, and that's both for your cropping and the pasture. Yeah, well, the, the it's the pasture that's the problem. Um, yep. And the cropping, well, we've sort of actually, well, we usually use our cropping to you with our livestock production system. Yep. And we've actually given up a couple of crops. One to you know keep the steers poking along and we've made some silage out of another one that was yep. unfortunately full of weeds and so yeah so and then there's the frosting scenario which yep. i think we'll press on to harvest with the rest of it but yep. um i'm sure there is damage there but it's just a bit hard to quantify you know what it, and it might, you know, who knows, it might have done us a favour because what is left there will fill and probably be good quality grain. So, yeah, 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 it's a bit of a trade off there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yep. no worries. Well, I think we might uh, uh, kick off here, folks. It's uh, 7 35 if everyone's comfortable to, to do that. Yes, just keep admitting people as they come. So, um, welcome to the Cell Feed or Gist What Is Your Plan B webinar, hosted by uh, Murray Local Land Services and the Holbrook Land Care Network. And as most of you would be aware, the from the autumn through the winter and into the spring, things have not gone to the usual plan and what we're used to. So, we're at a point now and probably have been for a while that uh, many farmers have had to start thinking about some choices of what's going to happen. So some hard decisions may need to be made, and particularly if you've got grazing stock coming into the summer and through the next autumn. 
So as the webinar suggests, there's a few options here, sell, feed, adjust, and probably a few others in there as well. But making some of these decisions are a little bit complex at times, and there's a few key factors you might be needing to consider. Tonight, we've got a range of presenters to cover some of those options and considerations in a uh, cropping context, if you're in a mixed farming, cropping, uh, pasture, livestock uh, enterprise. And there's also um, Martin Bruce is going to talk about if you're in a fairly um, mainly grazing livestock enterprise. One key thing to remember in all this, given the season that's been, is it's not only feed uh, as a potential issue, but providing adequate uh, quality quantity of uh, uh, quality drinking water for the stock. Um, as we all know, you can survive a little ways without feed, but more the imperative is the water. So we'll have a talk a little bit about that as well. So Martin Bruce is going to kick us off and help us understand some of the issues around pastures. Um, John Piltz, uh, who's with DPI, has been working in this space of fodder conservation for many years. We'll talk us through a little bit on uh, some of the issues around the crop conservation um, with damaged crops or crops that aren't performing to, to the standard we would like. And Paul Blackshaw is going to help us with a couple of tools there to crunch some, some of the numbers. And Jess Armstrong, who's with the whole Holbrook Land Care Network, is going to uh, highlight a couple of issues around uh, farm water management planning and a range of uh, options and events that Holbrook have got on offer that can help people sort out some of those issues as well. And we'll also have, <clears throat> pardon me, we'll also have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, as we go, if they're um, on point and towards the end as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to hand over to Martin Proust if you're ready to go there, uh, Martin. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I'll share my screen, bring this up, and then if I hit this, we should be able to go. Okay. Yep. Can you see that? Yes. Yep, all good to go. Okay, thanks very much. No, thanks, Paul. Yeah, as we were saying, sell, feed, or adjust. You know, what's our plan? Um, you know, there's many changes, and certainly for a lot of the southern part of uh, yeah the area. Yeah, since May, it's been a bit of a dry story. So, so let's have a look. Yeah, evaluating pastures for maintaining livestock during drier spring conditions. So, as we say, evaluating pasture, but yeah, you've got pasture quantity and then the pasture quality that we need to take into account. Um, you know, pasture quantity, of course, it's usually described as the herbage mass expressed in kilograms of pasture dry matter per hectare, kg dry matter per hectare. But herbage mass refers to uh, the total amount of pasture present taken at ground level and includes both green and dead material. Um, and again, this is sort of information sort of coming out of the good old ProGraze 101 type scenario. But um, but a similar thing, the important part of, of, of pasture is the pasture quality. Uh, and again, which is made up of numerous characteristics um, which can influence the intake um, of, of by livestock. But the key factor is digestibility. So, for example, you know, a leafy, leafy, you know, young, leafy, rapidly growing pasture may contain 85% water, uh, but you're looking around 75% digestibility. Uh, whereas a slightly older, flowering, more mature grass, uh, maybe 60% water, um, but only 60% digestibility. Digestibility also is directly, directly related to the energy content of the pasture, where again, something that's very green, leafy, up around 75% digestibility could be up around 10 to 11 megajoules of energy. And I've just got a picture here of the pasture ruler, which again is you know, something that's been around now for many years. Um, and it is a fantastic tool to use to get a good handle on just what your, you know, your, 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 your herbage mass is, what your dry matter availability is. Um, and unfortunately, sorry, this little page, there's a grass, there's a little stem of grass right here that's just covering it up. but. I must say, after a trip down to um, Brocklesby today for a uh, farmer's uh, workshop field day down there and driving backwards and forwards from Wagga via Henty, Wolbundry down to Brocklesby, there's a lot of pasture 
in this area down here between probably two, three, four, up to about five centimetres in height, which is giving us a range around that sort of 400, seven, you know, four, seven, six, seven hundred up to possibly around 1,000 to 1,200 kgs back there dry matter at the best. So, yeah, it's it's just getting a bit of a challenge. And, yeah, I've just got this in. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but, again, just to, yeah, a guide to digestibility decline, as as we know, as, as temperate pastures mature. So we like this up here, but I think at the present time, we've got a lot of material now down in this area where we, we're turning this probably 60 to probably 65 and mainly just below probably the 70% digestibility. So let's see what that's doing for us because, again, it, it, it just impacts the amount uh, that, that an animal can consume, um, which in turn then will impact on production of that, that animal. And then again, depending on the the, uh, the stage of productivity of the animal, whether they're a lactating animal um, or they're coming up the joining or they're a young animal that you're, uh, you're growing for productivity for uh, you know, a weaner or a, a heifer. So... But feed budgeting, yeah, a feed budget is used to work out, uh, you know, which livestock will get which paddocks, how long will each paddock be grazed, where will the livestock be moved to next. But the benefit of using a feed budget is that you can work out what to do if, you know, conditions start to turn dry. Um, and a great tool to use for feed budgeting is a very new tool that uh, LLS has, has been working on now for a number of years, but it's only become available in the southern part, the Riverina and the Murray uh, in the last six months, effectively, probably since April, May of this year. And yeah, the farming forecast, uh, I don't want to really spend a lot of time on it. It's uh, you know, got there's farmingforecaster.com.au. You'll be able to access that online or via the app that is available as, a, as an app as well through the app store. Um, but effectively, it's just the farming forecast is used as data from, from you know, on-farm soil moisture probes, weather stations, along with the CSIRO, CSIRO's farm stimulation modelling tool, Grass Grow, to create real-time updates and pasture conditions and forecasts for up to four months ahead. So it's just a grain. It's a it's a great tool, which you'll see here, that gives us, and, and sorry, I've just thrown this in because this is the current, uh, from the drought hub, the current drought, uh, combined drought indicator map. And um, I've selected two sites, the Mundaroo and the Corra site, just to have a look at for the farming forecaster. But overall, you can just see the area that we're in here for the central eastern Riverina uh, and then for the Murray, a similar thing for the central eastern Murray region, is that we're in this drought, the yellow, and then this sort of darker orange colour is the, is the drought-affected area. So, bang, we're in this area here, but still, there's been changes. And even Mundaroo, looking here, it's uh, just on the edge with screw to green you'll see on the side but it's actually not not performing too bad which you'll be able to see here now so the way that the farming forecaster works and again using this as a feed budgeting tool is through the system you have the soil moisture probe itself which depending on the location whether it's a pasture or it's a cropping basis there's a range between 10 to 60 centimeters and in a cropping area where where the the, the uh, probes are located, so often they don't start until twenty centimeters below the ground, just because of the fact of the, of the tillage equipment that could be used. But the area with the um, the soil probe is you get these moisture readings at 10, 20, 30, 40, down to 60. You also get your rainfall for the last uh, 24 hours and then also for the last 48 hours, and then you get a soil temperature. There are other, when you go into it, there's a heat more information you can click on. There's little icons, bars that you can tap on. But this is the main screen that we like to look at, and it's called the projected green herbage availability relative to historic variation. Now, this historic variation actually goes back over a 30-year rolling period. So today's the 16th of October. So it's going back to the 16th of October in 1994. Tomorrow, it'll go back to the 17th of October in 1994 to give us these classifications. But you'll see there's three areas here that they look at. You've got historically for the you know, green herbage growth for availability from your 50 to 90%. The 25 to 50%, so you've got this green shading area. There's there's the 25 to 50, which is sort of more of the average than normal, this area in here. Then you've got the lower, um, you know, sort of uh, 10 to 25% of, of herbage growth through the period over the years. That's but the red line, is it, Martin? Sorry? That's the red line? 
That's the, that's the, well, you've got the shading area, Paul, but then you've actually got the key indicator keys, which is a 90 percentile of, of that uh, herbage availability growth factor, um, which is then, you know, working back compared to the amount of rainfall temperature, all the other factors that are influencing this. So you've got the 90 percentile, the 50 percentile, which you probably refer to as your average, this one here, and then you've got the, the, the bottom 10 percent, which is the, you know, Again, probably the way, but there's a summary sheet that's provided, and yeah, uh, and, and the summary just gives you a, a, a quick check. Currently tracking in the top 10% of years on record, poor conditions and until January 15 will result in pasture availability in the bottom 50%. Uh, of years on record and average conditions will see pasture availability in the top 50% of years on record. So, but you've got this black line and this is the important, this is like the wiggle worm that we get when the elections are on, uh, that is giving us the, uh, the actual data, which is updated every seven days. And it's currently telling us here that it's more or less following, it's in between, but we also, the benefit here is that all these lines are very close together. So there's no great disparity between the 90 percentile to the 50 percentile in the Mundu area as we speak. But it's forecasting here, there's probably around 3,300 kgs per hectare dry matter available of forage. But the big key that we've got to look at is what's going to be happening in the next four to six weeks. Because Martin, can it, you... Can you point to that black line, please, with your so, cursor? Yeah, so, whoops, 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 whoops. Go on back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. If I point on it, can you, sorry, here, can you see this here? Yep, yep, that's yep, good. Yep, Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so if you if if you look at that there, you'll see yeah. So this is the black line. Um, and sorry, oh, I'm, yeah, looking at the wrong screen. Um, so you got the actual line here. So we got yeah, around thirty three hundred kg. Um, and but you've got the phase. What the concern being is what's going to be happening. And you know if the bombs. Good with their forecast coming up um, the next 24 to 48 hours if we get 20 30 40 mil we we, we will be able to probably follow this 50 percentile line uh which is this range here which is i think so again that might lead to a situation for the people in that uh, area from east of holbrook the the, the mundaroo manis tumbarumba area where yeah they might be able to follow business as usual and even have some uh, pasture availability that they could cut for hay or for silage. So yeah, it's it's at this stage, depending on what's going to happen in the next four to six weeks, it's it could be just business as usual going forward. But to give a comparison, here we're looking at at Corowa, and the the factors here at Corowa is similar again. Now these moisture probes have only been in um, probably since April May. And there's a calibration process that they're going through where you've got to have a complete wet soil and you've got to get a dry soil. And we're just not sure really here at the Corora site that we haven't had the full wet up of the soil profile. So don't be too alarmed by the three, six, five or six percent moisture profiles that's there because it's effectively been in since the, really the rain probably stopped down there. So but that's 10 minutes, Martin. Irrespective of that, you've got this here is the key area uh, that we're still looking at. And on this one, it brings up that uh, there's a warning. The drought lot is active at some point during this period. So again, and what we can see here is that for the Corra area, our herbage growth, we're back now probably around 900, just shy of 1,000 kg. But again, the trend showing from the active line, the black line, is that it's sort of back in this 10, if not you know, below the 20, 25% into the 10% range. So again, rain's going to be the critical thing here. So, and we're getting to that stage which in the next couple of weeks without rain, a lot of the producers in this you know, southern part, eastern, you know, central eastern part of the, um, of the Murray region are going to have to start looking at, at possibly confinement feeding. So, and Martin, uh, and Martin yeah. I just wonder, with that uh, figures of dry matter you got there, how, what are the implications there for what we're going to do with our our stock what are the implications there how do we translate what we're seeing into uh, a management decision well paul that's what i'm just going to try and look at here it's oh. it's um again well they've got the options there again it, it simply is well either they put them into a confined feeding area or yeah and there's going to be a cost associated with that 
or they could look at adjustment and maybe the people from Corra might be able to talk to the people up at Mundaroo um, who seem to have a bit of spare uh, forage up there. They might be able to send their uh, their sheep or the or the cattle specifically um, up to the Mundaroo area for for adjustment. Uh, you know, prior to the sake of getting to a stage of having to have to sell. So, but looking at the, the, the fact of having to feed. I've just got these couple of slides I just want to quickly just look at, and I'm looking at some uh, some dry ewes, and then I've got some looking at at cattle. But mindful of time here, Paul, I just want to look at this is just a quick calculation on the tons of supplement as bought needed to feed a thousand dry ewes at maintenance for one week, and I've got these ranges between a 50 kilo ewe, a 60 kilo merino ewe, a first cross ewe at 70 kgs, or or the heavier composite ewes. But you're talking here, just say looking at 11 ME, grain, barley, whatever it might be, and I've just put so a week they're going to consume up to five tonnes of, of, of that grain uh, to sustain per week, which, and I've done a few little calculations with that, and you'll be looking along the lines of, of the feed being between um at that rate there between sort of three at uh, you know fifteen hundred dollars or three hundred dollars a ton for grain um at the new season grain that's coming off we're going to be looking there between fifteen hundred dollars a week and up to if you're down to here up to probably nearly closer to two thousand dollars a week to be able to feed those stock so these are the you know, the, 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 the financial situations you're going to need to consider uh, to take into account to look at this budgeting program if you're going to go into feed. And then if they're going to go into a confined area, you'll probably need to put some hay in as well. Hay now is, you know, and with the frost damage, um, uh, there's a fair bit of hay in that southern area now being cut and baled. So prices could come back a little bit. But yeah, things are a little bit optimistic because the stock prices are still a little bit, you know, buoyant. They're up in that higher end. And with uh, the grain prices sort of, you know, hopefully they might come back a bit. And with the hay prices being, yeah, they might fall a bit as well. Well, it could be a good opportunity to be able to put some feed down the throat of the animals to maintain as opposed to have to cull and sell. Um, you know, and if you do need to cull and sell, is make sure you keep your core breeding stock. Um, I've got I've got some uh, lambs there, but I won't go into that, um, Paul, just mindful of time, but I'll just quickly feed down to the cattle. And this is, again, just talking at, uh, at, at the cattle. Tons of supplement need to feed 1,000 cows, sorry, 1,000, 100 cows uh, at two stages of pregnancy, 120 days or 200 days uh, for a week. Um, similar thing here. Now, we've actually put a mix together of 80% grain, 20% hay, um, which gives us a cost of around about 200 eighty dollars a ton to use that but a similar thing you're going to be looking there for anywhere from 4.3 up to you know depending on the size of the animal and at what stage of pregnancy up to six ton that they will require and looking at that 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 costing basis a similar thing there we have anywhere from sort of twelve thirteen hundred dollars a week up to potentially around eighteen hundred dollars a week you're going to be looking to be able to supply those animals that that feed to those hundred cows um and then you same thing for hay you're going to be looking there similar things between probably nine hundred dollars a week down here to you know up to fifteen hundred dollars a week to feed them here so yeah how much supplement do we need but this is that just putting some giving you some ideas there this information as i say is just just to help you calculate what what the costing being so that's for a week so yep. you know if it's going to last for, for six eight weeks or ten weeks well that you'll have to do the sums to work that out but it could it could work it out but again you've got the, the benefit of the uh, cost of the um uh you know the, the, the pricing of livestock is it could be a help there but you got, you got one minute decisions. left martin you got Thanks, one minute Paul. livestock management decisions well again make sound livestock management decisions um yeah, uh, sooner rather than later, yeah, reduce grazing pressure, as we were talking about, by selling, adjusting or, or confinement feeding. Um, but before you get at a stage of selling, I think it would be looking at where, wherever there is an opportunity for, for adjusting. Um, and then you've got the backup of confinement feeding. Concentrate your efforts on the stock that you have the potential to earn the most money, uh, such as retaining core breeders uh, and, again, certainly maintaining your genetic base. Early weaning helps beef producers to maintain cow condition, also for uh, for use. Uh, early weaning will also help 
maintain condition there. And and therefore the fertility of the breeding herd, you know, coming back after drought or coming back up to joining. But keep your options open. Maintain a positive cash flow, you know, by selling if you need to sell. Replace older stock with some younger you know, younger stock. Um, again, or sell the older cattle and keep finish you know, lambs. So you might get rid of some of the older cattle and keep your weaners and put them onto the paddocks that you have available. And I think that is it. Thank you, Paul. Any questions? And I'll stop sharing. So oh, you mute. Yep. Thanks a lot, John. Um, any quick questions? Um, otherwise, we might push on with John and come back to some questions later on. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand on the the top of the bar. There's a little hand raised there, and take yourself off mute if you want to ask a question. No worries. If you've got a question, write it down and we'll we'll circle back to it. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you now, John, to uh, give us a bit of a chat about some of the options with the cropping scenarios. Right. Thank you. So I just do share now, do I, Jess? You're yep. muted as well. Sorry, yep. You can share. So if you've got PowerPoint up, Go to the share button, which is just next to um, the leave button on the Teams yeah. window. And then window or entire screen? Uh, you will want, you will want screen. Okay. And then you'll just need to open the PowerPoint again. How's that? Working? No, not yet. How's that? Yep. Yes, Working. got All it. Right. Thank you. People have to bear with me a little bit on this. Um, I'm actually basically retired and I've just come out to fill in because poor old Jeff Minchin's got a sore throat. Uh, I, I want to talk really quickly about just a couple of things that I think are important if you're talking about salvaging fail crops. I'm not going to go into lots of detail. I prefer to get questions as we go along. So the first thing I'd say is we normally have crops that are moisture stressed, drought, or they're frosted. We've got an unusual situation at the moment because we've got drought stressed crops and we've got frosted crops. I'm a Curlman, so up here it's frost, down south is more drought. A couple of key points that come out of that. Um, with, with moisture stress, with drought, we normally have some indicators. The soil's dry, things are struggling, and we can get a few forecasts about ongoing rainfall. So it gives us a bit of time to plan and consider options. And we'll talk about a few of those. The second part is if it's frost, it's obviously pretty quick, it happens. And the recommendation is generally to act as quickly as you can to, to stop any further damage. Now that could be anything from the, the plant dying, it could be anything like uh, heavy rainfall, leaching out really badly, drought affected, uh, stress frosted crops or whatever. Anyway, what I will tell you though is we don't have a lot of information on what has happening to frosted crops when they've been struck. They've, the, the assumption is it's only a minimal effect on quality and that's based on anecdotal evidence or what we've seen come through the lab or whatever, but nobody's really ever done good solid work to look at track them over time. In a sense, frosted crops are relatively easy. If you've got frost damage, make a decision about whether or not it's got a grain option or it's it, it's past the grain option. If it's a crop that's stem frosted and it's completely written off, then consider your other options, which are adjusting or cutting for hay or silage. Given that you're going to have to operate really quickly, in most cases it'll be silage because it'll be too, the weather's not up to making hay in a lot of areas yet. The one that I'd like to spend a bit more time on is drought affected cereal crops. They're a little bit interesting. We've run them through in a couple of years and we found out that unlike most crops, energy content is normally very high. So, energy, might call ME or digestibility, are high and they tend to remain high over an extended period of time. 
they also tend to have very high sugar content. The impact on crude proteins is unknown, doesn't appear to be major. It seems to um, just be very, very similar, but be aware the drought affected crops can have high nitrate levels, which you will not know by just testing crude protein. Crude protein is, is calculated from the amount of nitrogen in the plant, and it doesn't matter whether it's from nitrate or true protein, you'll get the same answer. If you're concerned about nitrate levels being high with cereal crops or any crops, any drought stress crop, I strongly recommend take a sample and get it tested. It's pretty quick. There's a lab in Wagga and they can do nitrate testing basically in a couple of days. Um, the other comment I would make about drought affected crops, cereal crops, is because of the high sugar content, which is my explanation, they are implicated in hay shed fires. Now, if we think back to a few years ago when we had the millennial drought, people probably remember there was a time when in Victoria there was four or 500 hay shed fires, which were predominantly from cereal crops. And the, uh, the interesting thing about them happened um, was that they weren't necessarily within a week or two of being bailed. They were often two, three, and up to six months afterwards. What that tells me is that by getting wet later on, given the high sugar content, they are relatively unstable. Whereas normally we'd make hay, if it's dried out properly, it gets a bit of water on it, gets a bit of mold, but it's not a problem. But under, under drought stress, it is an issue. The other thing is we need to think about the value add opportunity for using livestock or trading as hay. Now, a couple of points I'd like to really make about this. Uh, Martin talked about digestibility and digestibility in rapidly growing stock is, is critical, as he said, to how much growth you're going to get. Now, in rough calculated terms, it's not going to be 100%, but if you've got actively growing steers, for every 1% digestibility increase, it probably equates to 70 or 75 grams growth rate, additional growth rate per day. So if you go from 65 to 66%, you'll get an extra 70, 75 grams per day. And in actively growing weathers, rapidly growing weathers, you're not as much, you're probably going to be about 12 or 14 grams per day. It's very minor, doesn't sound that much. Let's think about it though. If we go back to the cattle, 75 grams per day per, per percent, a 10% change in quality equates to 750 grams per, so three quarters of a kilo per day. So if your quality of your crop drops by 10%, then you're going to lose three quarters of a kilo of potential live weight gain. I raise this because what I'm going to say to people is we're at a stage where crops are, when crops are severely moisture stressed, they're going to rely on getting rain pretty quickly and reasonable rain pretty quickly. If that rain doesn't come, they will fall over. But when you do your calculations, I want you to consider that what happens now, if I've got a crop that's, a crop that's potentially going to yield two and a half tonnes of grain, for example, if it rains, if I then turn around and say, well, what happens if it doesn't rain, but I wait three weeks to work out whether I think that the rain's, rain's going to keep it going, be aware that in that time, in that three weeks, which is 21 days, you've probably dropped 10% in quality and you've probably lost three quarters of a kilo in live weight gain. So all I'm, I'm not going to try and tell you to make decisions. What I'm saying to you is be aware what happens, what the implications are of delaying on making your decisions. If, however, your potential yield crop, crop yield is really, really high um, and the value of livestock's not real good, your quality of your crop is down to a stage where it's not much better than maintenance anyway, then the, the whole scenario changes. So what I'm suggesting to you is 
every person's different, but you need to make informed decisions. And those informed decisions will mean you'll have to know the quality or be able to assess the quality of the crop. You'll have to know how much yield there is, because if the crop doesn't yield very much, that's going to change whether or not it's suitable. For example, and this is anecdotal, this is off the, uh, uh, this is just a rule of thumb. If your yield, your total dry matter yield is below about one and a half to two tonnes of dry matter per hectare and you cut, the chances are that you will lose such a substantial amount of material that the economics of cutting are dramatically changed. What you need to do is you need to work out if I cut it now, what's the value of that as a feed resource or what's the value of that as a hay resource which I can sell or what's the value of that if I continue on and take the punt that it may rain. I just want to show you a little bit of data that comes out of Wagram tomorrow. For those of you who remember 2008, it was a terrible year. These are the yields of crops that we grew, cereal crops that we grew at Wagga. So you can see there at the boot stage, one and a half tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And it basically didn't increase very much up until the milk. ME content was really, really high. 12 and a half, 11.7 and 11.2. That's the type of material which is, would be able to support growth rates of a, a, a kilo a day easily in cattle. Interesting, you look at that. Uh, the crude protein content in the first one's quite good. It's a little bit low in the others. But that's a typical, really severely drought-stressed crop. You'll also notice there that WSC is sugar. 30% of the crop is sugar up until the last stage. So that's why it's very high in energy because sugar is very high in energy. But it's also why you have that risk of fire damage. If we turn it around to 2010, which I'm putting in just just as a, an interesting anecdote, where crop yields were massive. It was probably as high yielding forage year as I've ever seen in my life. And yields, tons of dry matter, they're up between 15 and 25 tons, but ME is quite low. So even at the boot stage with an ME of 9.9, .9, that material is not really going to allow you to produce much in terms of livestock. It will produce, but not a hell of a lot. So first point from that, if you've got severely dressed crop, stressed crop, yield is going to be low. So the likelihood of being able to cut that material is quite, and, and actively conserved a significant portion is, is low because you'll lose most of it during the raking and cutting process. But if you do, there's a few things you need to do. One is, for example, maybe cut it with a draper front and put it in a windrow and let it dry that way because it's probably fairly dry anyway. The second thing to be aware of is if you do it, probably silage is a safer one because of that high sugar content. But the third part is if it's a drought stress crop, you've got a product there that is capable of supporting really good growth rates. So don't discount it. Now, that may mean that your best option is to graze it because at a, at a really low yield of dry matter of sort of below three tonnes, the potential crane yield may not be very high at all. But in this case, if you graze that, just be aware that it's dry, it's drought stressed, and if it rains, you may lose a lot of quality. Um, so I'd be grazing that sooner rather than later and potentially relying on other crops or other pastures to be fit for conservation. The other interesting thing about 2010, if you do the sums on that, what it costs to produce, it's really clear you can start, there's a clear um, relationship between the cost of production of hay or silage and the energy value of the hay or silage. And it works in reverse. So as the as the yield and uh, sorry, as the as the potential livestock yield goes up. You, you have the capacity to pay more money for conserving the forage. If the yield goes down, the livestock yields goes down, the quality goes down, then you've got to make that material very, very, 
very, very cheaply. And if you get to the stage where you're you're not even producing, if you're if it's a sub maintenance diet, which would have been the case in some of those ones in 2010, you will lose money on the process. You will find that uh, whatever you whatever you cut, the cost of cutting it because it's going backwards, you'll get into a situation where the more you actually cut and produce, the further you'll go financially backwards because you're making more material that you can't make any money out of. In that scenario, look around, see if you can find someone who will buy that as a standing hay crop that they can use for mixed diets, high grain rations. Like Two minutes, lot. John. Right, right, thanks. Now, the only other comment I would make, what I've given you there is cereal crops because we've that's where we've got most of the data. With canola crops, canola crops don't behave the same. Canola crops, as soon as they pass flowering stage, are losing quality, and it doesn't matter whether they're drought stressed or what. So in the case of canola crop, be aware that if you are looking to potentially make hay, get in and do it early while you've still got some production. And where your crops in terms of the cereal crops sit between 2008 and 2010, I have no idea. So if you're really worried, same deal, cut a sample and get it tested. And finally, this is, I'm not going to try and explain this. There are tools out there. Paul's going to talk to you a few, but there's about a few, but this is one that the Department of Prime Ministries or whatever we're called now, um, put together some time ago. And it allows you to work through whether or not you make, take your crops for fodder, grain or grazing. And it's, looks complicated it's on the web you can download it it's a simple excel spreadsheet if you work through it and put all the data in get someone to help you if you don't know what you're doing i strongly recommend using a tool like this not doesn't have to be this one as the best way to make decisions and that's it uh, no worries. hey th thanks very much john and if you stop sharing now that'll put us back to the big screen beautiful um Thanks a lot for for that, uh, John. Uh, I just wanted to check on a point there. You made the point that if if the total dry matter, when we're talking about gross dry matter, leaf, whatever grain there may or may not have be, if that's uh, less than one and a half to two tonnes per hectare, that you're basically pushing it uphill to actually try and get a decent lot of uh, baling out of that. You're going to lose a lot of material in that process. Is that right? That's it, because you consider a crop like that's probably only eight or 12 inches tall and it hasn't got a lot of bulk to it. As soon as you start raking it or processing it, um, you'll you'll lose it. And particularly the fingers on a baler will struggle to pick it up. Yeah, so and that, that's a scenario where grazing the standing crop, if, if you don't need to maintain ground cover, might be the better option if you want to use it for stock. That yeah, That's a scenario where your things like quality and that take second place to some practical realities about yep. what you can do. Excellent. No worries. Hey, thanks, John. A any other questions to, for John at this point? Oh, uh, I'm going to pass over to Mr. Blackshaw now to help us consider some of the the ideas around what sort of numbers we might want to crunch and how we might want to crunch those to help us in our decision making around what we might want to do, whether we're selling stock, or keeping it, and what it might cost us in the meantime. We can see your email there, Paul. Yeah, I realise that, Paul. I'm just, uh, I'm <laughs> Probably just, that one uh, from me earlier. Hey, yeah, there could be one from you. I'm just going to have another crack at this. Yeah. That looks a bit better, doesn't it? I'll just, yes. um, yep. I'll just go to my uh, full screen there. That look okay? Beautiful. Good. Where Thanks, go? Paul. I'll give you a yell at 10 minutes. Righto, good. Um, I'll be reasonably quick. Um, so we've talked, um, everybody so far has talked about decision making uh, and um, I'm going to talk about, I suppose, some of the financial implications of decision making. Uh, and, and I think John has already used the term evidence-based decision making. So a lot of times as farmers, we make decisions using gut feel and, and that's really valid because it's a reflection on something that's happened in the past. It's a reflection on your wisdom and your experience. But actually using some evidence um, to help you make decisions, I, I think, is really important. Um, obviously, putting some numbers around a decision can sometimes deflect from personality issues. So if you 
and I do a lot of work in multi-generational family businesses where there can be disagreement about what might what should be happening or what might happen. And so if you actually put some numbers around a decision, it can help deflect from some of those personality issues or take some emotion out of a decision. And 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 in some ways, it's the numbers that make the decision, not you as a person or a farmer. So it actually um, takes a bit of pressure off you in some ways. Also, I think putting some numbers around a decision can really help a, when you're stuck and you're at a fork in the road and you don't know pr perhaps which way to go, but also how to communicate it well with others. So to be actually able to sit down and look at some of the numbers around this with the other people in the business helps you, um, you know, make make potentially a better decision. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to a, a really simple little tool that, that I use a lot. Um, and and it's a, a tool called a partial budget. Um, partial budgets are used to examine a really simple change in a business. Uh, and generally, we like we like all the other um, factors to be remaining steady. So, if you're if you're looking at doing a a big change to your business or one that goes over a couple of years, then you're much better off to use a full annual cash flow budget to 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 model the implications of that decision. But these are these are um, uh, little tools that can help with some of those simple decisions that both John and Martin have already talked about um, that you might be facing um, in the next couple of months. I think, and I I like using the term that they actually support the back of the envelope calculation. So a lot of times people will be thinking about whether they might um, destock or whether they might send some animals up into the high country for adjustment or whether they cut their crop for, for hay or whether they don't, um, a lot of times they might do some back of the envelope calculations about about whether that's the right thing to do or not. And really this tool that I'm going to show you um, supports that back of the envelope calculation and also supports your gut feel. All we're doing though is increasing the chance of a desirable outcome. So none of this guarantees success. Really, it just uh, helps you with your decision making. Um, so the, 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 the main point, if you take nothing away from this, is, is look at these four dot points that I put on the screen and think of them as a little checklist. So when you're doing your, your little back of the envelope calculations, check each one of these off. And generally, there's four components. There'll be, there'll be added income, there'll be added costs, there'll be reduced costs and reduced income. So they're the four areas that you need to think about when you're making one of these decisions. And I just like that to, to list those because it's a good opportunity to check them off as you go along because sometimes you'll, you will miss stuff that's actually really important. Um, obviously, as you add stuff into this little spreadsheet, I'm going to show you the, the, the net impact will be either negative or positive. And so that will help drive what decision you make in the long run. So, uh, Paul Simpson, I'm assuming that we're going to be able to share this little spreadsheet with people after the workshop. So, you know, this is a this is a, um, a an Excel spreadsheet that is very simple to operate. It's got those four areas that you need to consider, and basically you fill in you fill in the gaps and you see down the bottom left hand side there's a little spot that says change in net income and that's the number that will spit out and tell you about whether this is a uh, likely to be a good thing to do or whether it's likely to be something that uh, mightn't work in the long run. So I've just done a little really simple little case study to show you how this operates. Oh, the other really important thing is that, uh, and, and our other two speakers have also said this, is that this is important for you to do with your numbers on your farm, because you know even a farm that's next door to another farm will have a different set of circumstances. They will be driven by a different set of, um, uh, you know, reasons for doing different things so you know you need to do this for yourself and and i suppose that's the point of what i'm trying to say to you is here's a here's a process here's a system here's a method but you need to go away and do your own numbers you need to 
uh, and both both those speakers have shown you some really great tools to help spit out, um, you know, how much feed you're likely to use, how how much energy uh, per animal you're likely to need, how much weight you're going to put on. So you really do need to crunch these numbers, and this is, I think, a way of bringing all that together. But I just threw some numbers together for you know for a scenario that just shows us how the, how the tool works. So it's late October. We're nearly late October. Following a dry spring, you're faced with either selling your 50 steer calves now for a lower price or feeding them all the way through to the traditional new year sales where you might where you might might normally sell them. So you're looking at selling them now, you know, at 320 kilos perhaps, or you or you take them all the way through and get them to 400 kilos, which is what you would normally do. And farmers are preachers of habit. And so a lot of times people will just say, well, we always sell in, in, you know, end of January, February, those New Year sales. So we will do that again this year. But this is a good little exercise to see whether that makes sense or not. The feed that you've got to, to put down their throats is a combination of some hay on hand that you already have, but you're also going to have to buy some. So you're going to buy, be buying some hay and some grain or pellets. Um, and the other important thing to think about, and I think Jess is going to talk about this in a minute, it's already been touched on is you might need to cut drinking water and so not only is there a is there a time factor around that and a emotional factor around that um there's also a cost to it as well so i'm going to just show you a little bit about what that might look like so the very first step is that we look at in in this case we've got a decrease in net income so because we've sold those animals at a cheaper weight we might actually get a slightly higher price per kilo, but we're actually going to tear up for our 50 head, we're going to tear up about $11,000. So that means um, uh, our, our income for the year will be down $11,000 because we've chosen to sell them at a lighter weight uh, and so we get less income. So hopefully that makes some reasonable sense. Again, these numbers will look very different from yours. There, there is some crystal ball gazing required in this exercise, but that's where you rely on your gut feel a little bit. But you might talk to your agents as well uh, to actually see about what the implication of that's likely to be. The next step is that we're actually going to decrease some costs. So, yes, we're going to tear up some money by selling those animals early. But one of the things we're going to not have to do is buy feed. So we said that our feed requirement is a combination of boarding feed, uh, and this is, reflects the boarding feed, about eight and a half thousand dollars. One of the things I love doing with farmers, and they don't like doing, is valuing their own time. And so there is actually a labour content, a, a dollar figure for the labour for actually feeding these animals as well, about five thousand dollars over that three or four month period. And there's a potential that you might have to actually cart and buy water. And so when you work out how much water an animal drinks times by the number of animals times by the number of days, that can actually uh, really quickly add up. And a lot of people don't perhaps think about the potential cost of that. Um, one of the other reflections I've had from a farmer when we talk about the cost of labour is, as they said, well, instead of us feeding uh, hungry mouths every day over the summer, we can actually go to the beach or go to the dam or something with our kids over the school holidays. So there's a bit of an emotional thing around this too, because there's actually not much fun in feeding hang hungry animals um, in the middle of a drought every day for months on end as well. And the other thing we've got to think about, and this is sort of the last step, is, is to think about um, and when we call this opportunity cost, and and what this says is that we had a bit of hay already in the shed, and so instead of us feeding it to those animals, we could potentially sell it. Now, in a lot of cases, people won't sell it; they'll actually choose to keep it. But we still need to reflect um, that this is a this is a uh, has a do dollar value of, of about four thousand dollars in this case of that of that hay that we either choose to keep in the shed or we actually might be able to sell it. One of the other things that does happen sometimes in a drought too is that the cost of the hay, the value of the hay sitting in the shed actually goes through the roof. So you might actually find that you um, might actually achieve a much higher price of selling the hay to somebody else rather than just leaving it sitting in the shed. So the when, when we 
uh, plug all these numbers into our little um, into our little spreadsheet. You can see down the bottom there that the implication of all these changes is 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 nearly nine thousand dollars positive. So initially, we might think that we sell the animals early. We're gonna, you know, we're not gonna get as much income. But once you start considering all these other implications in the business, it's actually a nine thousand dollar positive uh, decision for the business. So. Um, as I said earlier, these numbers will look very different for each individual. There is some crystal ball gazing, but the more you talk to people, whether that's neighbours, whether that's you know your advisors or your consultants or people in LLS or DPI or your agent, you you start to build up some evidence that helps you make this decision, and potentially. Um, potentially by actually looking at these numbers, you say, well, actually, we are better off to sell these animals now. Um, we're going to be we're going to be better off financially and potentially we're going to be emotionally better off because we're not going to be feeding animals every day and carting water every day through the middle of a drought. So, Paul, that was really just a, a, a really quick little snapshot of a tool. As I said, I'm assuming that we're going to be able to send that little spreadsheet out to people if nothing else, use the little checklist just to check, do a little checklist for your numbers that you're doing on the back of the envelope. And once you have a little bit of practice at these things, um, hopefully it starts helping you with your decision making. No worries. Hey, thanks very much for that, Paul. And uh, I've already sent that spreadsheet out to everyone who's registered. So that should be sitting in your email box there, a blank version of that to put your facts and figures in there. Just a couple of quick questions, Paul. If if this was a, a cropping scenario that John was sort of alluding to before, the the pluses and minuses in there, for example, would be if you're going to salvage any grain out of that as a that would be the, the grain yield you might get out of it. And that would be offset against using that same material as feed that you might otherwise have to buy into the summer, I'm guessing. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, correct. Correct. So in, in your in your cropping scenario, what you'd be saying is that, you know, the decrease in income is the is the crop is the crop yield, the grain that you're not going to be able to sell. But over in terms of the reduced costs is that you're actually going to you're going to be able to supply that um that feed to an animal, so you're going to not have to bring in feed. Uh, and somebody earlier was talking about weight gains, things like that. Is that you will actually be able to calculate, you know, in a fairly rough fashion, um, what the financial implication of that decision might be. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Um, just before we, because I want to come back to you, Susan, because you've sort of described earlier on a scenario that. Paul and John have sort of touched on already, but I just before we go there, I just wanted to check in with Jess if she wants to give us a bit of a, a rundown on the farm water management uh, planning and the options there. Yeah, of course. So for anyone who's not familiar with me, my name's Jess Armstrong. I'm the Community Engagement Officer at Holbrook Landcare Network and one of the delivery partners for the Farm Water Management Planning Project. And essentially, my job here tonight is just to introduce you to the project and potentially what you can get out of being involved um, either with our upcoming events or the events um, that are being run by our delivery partners for this project across the southern New South Wales footprint. Um, so essentially, if you start seeing um, our key messages around this project up on your social media or, or in your local communications that you come across, you'll see that we, in terms of farm water, we are communicating about, you know, the importance of knowing your numbers, knowing your needs and knowing the gap in your farm water systems and, and building a plan and having that plan and utilising it in your business. So uh, essentially... Um, the on-farm water management program uh, planning project is funded by the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund, um, supported by the Southern New South Wales Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub, and it's being rolled out across Southern New South Wales by a brilliant network of farming systems groups and landcare organisations. Our goal through the project is to help farmers and land managers prepare for drought and, dr and tough dry times. 
by running workshops and events to help them build awareness and skills to manage these situations with confidence. Um, ignore the fact that I spent confidence wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> through our workshops and field days and events, um, our, the on-farm water management planning project ultimately hopes that we can enable farmers to know their numbers, know their needs, know the gap and have a plan built to ensure that they have better water security, increased water quality and the opportunities to optimise their systems. So obviously throughout tonight, um, Martin and John and Paul have talked about a lot about the things uh, for example, how digestibility decreases when feed starts to dry off and therefore the water's not in the feed and the animals need to compensate for that somewhere. And then, of course, there's other components of that where you might need to cart water or where water quality might be decreased to the point where you can't utilise certain watering points and that changes the way that you strategically graze your property um, or, or other things that you look at doing. Um and it also changes the way that you perceive potential opportunities. For example, as as Martin was saying, um, there might be some regions that have greater growth and you might say, yeah, okay, let's take on some adjustment cattle to build up a bit of cash flow. Um, but if you don't have the background numbers of what your farm water management plan is or know what your capacity is on your farm for water, you might not be as well equipped to take on that opportunity as you you think you are. So essentially this project is all about running events and getting interaction with farmers and landholders to help us run your numbers so that you can improve your confidence in that, that one component of your farm so that you can be making those decisions about how you manage the livestock and your pasture. So I just want to introduce you to the rest of the partners that are involved across southern New South Wales. Um, obviously, we have eight delivery partners in this, including Corora District Landcare, Holbrook Landcare Network, Rice Growers Association, Riverine Plains, Western Murray Land Improvement Group and West Hume Landcare. And if, as you can see, we're located all across um, the Murray region. And we also have uh, Riverina Local Land Services and South East Local Land Services also in involve running some events. So if you can see where you are close on that map, do not hesitate to reach out to these local groups and get in contact with them. Follow them and reach out and see when they're running these farm water audit workshops to help you run your numbers and field days as well to introduce new information, technology and different management decisions for how you monitor and utilise farm water. I wanted to bring some events to your attention that I know that are coming up in the 2024 calendar. Obviously, Holbrook Landcare has adapted the Farm Water Audit Workshop, which used to be a one-day workshop, and I've converted that into a three-part online series, which you can register for and log on to at lunchtime. Um, we've got our first one coming up on the 29th of October, which is focusing on the first component of the farm water audit, which is focusing on quantifying your needs, so your livestock, your household, and things that you might need for bushfire or for general farm use like spray. The second part, which is coming a fortnight later on the 12th, it's focusing on estimating your maximum capacity in your farm system. So how much you can store in your tanks and how much you can store in your dams. And then taking that to the next step and doing an evaluation of what do you currently have on hand? Like if I was to ask you to go out tomorrow, could you tell me how much water is in your dam? And could you tell me whether or not that's gonna be sufficient for your livestock coming into a summer season? The last part that we go through is, of course, calculating your losses like evaporation and seepage and calculating how long that water will last. And that one we're carrying out on the 26th of November. And as I mentioned, these are entirely online. These are just one hours um, during the day that you log on and I'll present all the information for you. We do have some value adding presentations as well, um, including some water quality, livestock water quality uh, with the local land services vets. Um, which we have also got some awesome tools as well that you can use um, like remote imaging and um, historical satellite stuff to help you plot which dams and stuff will stick with you through a summertime. 
So that's our Holbrook Landcare events. But also coming up in 2024, we've also got Riverina Local Land Services are running two field days um, on farm water management at The Rock and at Tarkata on the 2nd of November and 12th of November, respectively. And we've also got Cora District Land Care doing their farm dams water for water quality, wildlife and water security field day on the 6th of November. So there's plenty more events as well scheduled for 2025 across the southern New South region, um, which are going to be conducted by the assortment of delivery partners. So once again, reach out to those guys, see when they've got these events coming up. There is also a lot of scope in this project for the project officers to work with people individually to help them do their farm water audit and conduct and sorry, conduct their farm water audit and to essentially establish a farm water management plan, which is essentially a Bible that you can go back to every time that you are making a decision about what you want to do on farm. Um, but it's also really valuable to help you make decisions about how you're going to improve infrastructure and where you might need to prioritise infrastructure uh, across your property too. So that's that's me introducing the project, inviting you along to any of our events if they're of any interest. And of course, if you have any questions um, or are not sure where to start, please get in contact with us at Holbrook Landcare or whoever your closest um, farming system group or land care organisation is. Um, but yeah, that's me. Thanks, Jess. That's brilliant. Um, I just wanted to uh, just check in if, if there's any more questions around what uh, Martin, John and Paul uh, spoke about. Um, and bear in mind in that context that what th uh, those guys have spoken about, that your farm water is one of those key components about um, uh, are you able to graze, graze some of those pastures or some of those crops in a scenario where your dams might be drying? Um, there can be added complications. Many times people have had great paddocks of feed, but the uh, water in those paddocks has dried up, so that's uh, added a whole different dimension to their their dramas and stress. So uh, we need to bear that in mind as well. Uh, any questions from the floor before I just ask a quick quick one to Susan, um, who she spoke about before? While people are thinking, Susan, you mentioned that your season there, you had a bunch of steers that you're looking to graze on some of your uh, crop that wasn't doing so well. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and they're now booked into the feedlot to go on the, I think it's the 3rd of uh, November, uh, and they're doing very well. Um, and probably the question is what to do with the crop afterwards. I think probably just get the sheep in there, eat it and spray it out and conserve moisture. Yep. Um, it was a decision that was easy for us because this is what we do. We are livestock producers and when push comes to shove, we don't have any problem making decisions about getting the livestock off our property uh, for, for good money. Well, not that it's great at the moment, but we're, we will be happy to sell the stock the way they look. Um, the other thing is just lovely to see John back. He must have taught me so much over the years every time I heard him talk. <laughs> um, the thing you forget about when you decide in in our neck of the woods, when you decide to uh, say cut a crop for silage or whatever, the yield you get can get off it is phenomenal compared to the grain you may cut. Um, weeds sometimes are not always bad. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I've got to say. Yeah, no, that's good. And and Susan, the, the other point there with your, your steers that uh, John made the very salient point on was your drought-stressed crops, um, that high digestible energy and really good feed value. And as you say, your steers are going to get up to up to the weight to go into the feed feedlot. Um, a lot better on that. Let's let's be not be too harsh, that uh, struggling crop. Um rather than if it was a big bulky one, you'd probably have more steers, but you might not get the same live weight gain per day um, with more steers on a higher, a higher a yielding crop. But um, from what John said, the drought stress one there, it's got some good quality in it and it's going to finish off your steers in time for the 2nd of November. That is the plan. I hope yeah. he's right. <laughs> no, no, that sounds very and, good. And 
Uh, and Susan, like... and Susan, oh, I talked earlier about the crystal ball. You don't need a crystal ball if you've got your animals booked in and you know what a Ford contract is for them <laughs> in terms of price. So it helps make that decision even easier, doesn't it? Well, sometimes I just think I'm as glad I'm glad that I'm as old as I am because all this shit's happened before and it'll happen <laughs> again. And you just get on with it, and you know what mistakes you made in the past, and you go, oh, don't do that again. That was silly. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's good to be old. And that's, that's great. I'd, I'd great like to uh, second that. I'd like to say <laughs> thank you, Susan, for your kind words. And if I remember correctly, 15 odd years ago, you made some very, very good loop and silage in a drought. <laughs> we, we couldn't even get it to cure. We had to try and put it in the microwave to see. If it, was, <laughs> it was, yes, it was quite amusing and it was the um highest you know you you know energy silage or whatever yeah. that um that you could possibly make and we did everything wrong yeah. <laughs> it worked out all right in the end yes yeah. it was all right on the night but it was a bit of a struggle getting there yeah uh, no, that sounds great that sounds great the other comment i would like to chuck in like i talked about cereals and i talked about canola and the fact that the cereals could be built between one type of crop and the other. Oats is the other one. Oats will be very similar to canola. It'll just decline. It doesn't hold up in quality the same way. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, John. I've just Good got one last question for Martin before uh, we wrap up. Martin, you displayed a little uh, card there at one point with a different colours, like there was green at the top and and brown gold down the bottom. I think it was a ProGraze card. Um, yes. Where where could people get access to those things? How do they how do they get access to that? Or even the, uh, the little pasture meter. How do they get access to those? Yeah, things? well, that, well, the pasture meter is actually through. It's the MLA pasture meter. Uh, but we do actually do have at LLS we do have pasture meters available, and the. It's the the pasture card, which is the what they refer to as the pasture benchmarking card, um, is part of the ProGraze program. So, uh, and it is available through the ProGraze booklets that we do have available as well. Yep. Yeah, so, if uh, anybody's uh, wanting further information on that, yeah, it's just reaching out, contacting us, and we can we can get that organised for. Them. Yeah. So, no worries. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'll just um, share my last screen here. Um, if there are no further questions, can everyone see that? Cool, thank you. So yeah. um, it, now's the time to ask your question or follow up with us. You've obviously, everyone's got access to my email through the invite and confirmation of the event. But thanks very much for coming along tonight and uh, to the event hosted by Murray Local Land Services and also our partners, Holbrook Land Care Network. Um, a recording of the webinar will be available and I'll organise uh, that with our communications comms people over the coming week. And I'll also, at about that time, distribute a follow-up, just a feedback sheet for you to uh, give us an indication of how you found this webinar, but also, and more importantly, to enable you to put down ideas of events that you would like to see uh, covered in some of these sorts of uh, webinar type events as well because really there's no point us banging on about stuff that you don't want to know about so if you tell us what you need um, and that's the important thing uh, we can go about organizing some of that stuff before we wrap up I just want to open to any of the other presenters to make any last comments or any other questions from the floor because we have gone over a little bit now you're probably missing your favorite tv show but um, any any last words, comments from our presenters? No worries. Okay. That's all good. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> okay, then. Thank you very much. And so thank you, everybody, everybody uh, for coming along tonight. And we'll uh, leave it. But if the presenters want to stick around, we'll just have a quick chat before we wrap up. Thanks very much for your input too, Susan. But very, very good. Oh, pleasure. Thank and you. Susan, we're not old. Not really old. <laughs> Experienced. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> right. I might need your uh, just guidance here, Jess. Rather than me leave, how do I just 
stop the meeting? Yes, if so, there should be a more option right next to your camera on the left hand side. Yep. And you should be able to press that and then record and transcribe will be the first option. And you just need to click that and select stop recording. Cool. Great. And um, that's probably a bit.